Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to our second installment of Coffee with the Playhouse. I hope you have your LJP branded coffee mug at the ready. Uh, this is our second Coffee at the Playhouse. We are so glad to see all of our subscribers back with us. We have a wonderful event today. We're going to be joined by our uh, rich family artistic director of La Jolla Playhouse, Christopher Ashley, interviewing uh, for two-time former artistic director and current director emeritus, Des Makinoff. It's going to be a fantastic conversation. But in the meantime, while we wait for you all to gather and while we wait for the coffee to percolate, we're going to play a little LJP trivia. So take down your answers. Be sure to email them to subscriber at ljp.org to be entered into an opportunity drawing for a Starbucks gift card for use at future coffees with the Playhouse. All right, here we go. Let's go to question one. Where was the original location of La Jolla Playhouse? That's right, when we were revived in 1983, it was on the campus of UC San Diego. Of course, La Jolla Playhouse was started in 1947. Where was it originally located? Write down the question and be prepared for the second one. Here we go. Which of the Playhouse founders was on the rowing team at UC Berkeley? All right, so we talked in 1947, three Hollywood actors founded the original La Jolla Playhouse. One of them was a Cal Golden Bear on the rowing team. Which one? Write down that answer. Have it ready to send a subscriber at ljp.org. For those of you just joining us, my name is Gabe Green. I am the Director of Artistic Development, and we are just waiting for more people to gather before starting the show. Grab a, uh, a pencil or start an email to subscriber.org. Send the trivia answers there for a chance at a Starbucks gift card. Here's the third question. What was the first show that Des Mackinoff directed at the Playhouse? In the, when he was named artistic director, when it was revived in 1983. That was back when the uh, subscription seasons were just in the summer. The Playhouse was a summer only show. Uh, and that first season had three productions before we uh, had the space back to UC San Diego's graduate uh, theater and dance program. So what was the first show that Des directed? All right, our final question. How many years combined did Christopher Ashley and Des Mackinoff each helm the Playhouse as artistic director? So as I mentioned, Des had two different tenures as artistic director. Christopher Ashley is in the midst of his first. Uh, so how many years combined did their tenures run? Once again, send those answers to subscriber at ljp.org. You'll be entered into an opportunity drawing for a $20 Starbucks gift card. Right on. We are ready to begin, and it is my great honor to introduce you to the Managing Director of La Jolla Playhouse, Debbie Buckholz. Good morning. Thank you, Gabe. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, it's daunting to think about a, a summer in La Jolla. Since 1983, there hasn't been a summer without live theater on stage at, at the Playhouse. But we are excited to have our second coffee with you this morning, and we can't wait to be able to be back with you all live in the theater, um, our administrative staff, our production staff, our front of house staff, our back of house staff, everyone misses you all so very much. And we can't wait to be back with you when it's safe and, and we're all able to make live theater again. Um, but in the meantime, I'm excited to be able to introduce to you, um, I would say the two gladiators, well, certainly the two gladiators of American theater at the Playhouse, um, but certainly the most formidable team of, um, of artistic directors that any regional theater has ever, ever been able to, to manage. Um, I've been at the Playhouse for 18 years now almost. It will be 18 years in September. And throughout that time, either Des McEnough or Christopher Ashley has been our artistic director, um, which is a, a, a remarkable feat for any regional theater to accomplish. Um, and they are just titans of their field. And so, the one silver lining, and there are a few, but one very special silver lining of not being able to be live with you right now is that we're able to gather people who are generally so incredibly busy in their lives and to be able to sit for coffee this morning with Des and with Chris and to hear them talk about their, their, their artistic work and their time at the Playhouse is indeed special. So 
I am excited to introduce to you um, the artistic director emeritus of La Jolla Playhouse, Des Mackinoff, and the current Rich Family artistic director of La Jolla Playhouse, Christopher Ashley. Gentlemen. Thank you, Debbie. Thank, thanks, Debbie. I like the word gladiator. That feels very, uh, I don't know, substantial or dangerous or something. Des, so fantastic to have you with, with us today. It's so great to be here, Chris. I'm delighted to be the, to be rejoining um, the subscribers for a second one of these events. Um, we miss you. Um, we can't uh, uh, wait to be together again in the aisles and in the seats and in the lobbies. But in the meantime, we have um, one of my heroes, um, Des Makinoff. And uh, I, uh, I actually applied for this job uh, once earlier when the, the, the artistic director job was, was coming available. And um, I, La Jolla Playhouse has always been the, the theater that I have um, most wanted to be part of. And then that is in huge part due to the extraordinary work over two tenures as artistic director of um, the man sharing the screen with me. So welcome, Des. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, there's so much to talk about, right? I actually don't. I don't know what the answer is to the accumulated number of our two, um, uh, of our two uh, or three uh, periods as our district director. Do you know the number? You know, I, I think there are some a little bit some blurry lines uh, depending on how you you add things up, because of course one doesn't generally go from January to January. But can I guess, or am I going to spoil the contest if I do that? I, I think people have already wrote in if they're going to write in. So take a guess. Okay. I mean, at some point, they'll I, tell I they're right. I think it may be uh, 29 is what I would guess. It's I'm either gonna, 29 or 30. I'm going to I'm going to take a guess, because neither one of us was prepped on this. I'm going to say 33. Oh, my God. I'm going to, uh, but but that might be over overstating it. You have been there a long time. I've, I've, I'm, I'm on year 13 now. Oh, so. oh then I'm wrong. Then you're, you're, it's closer to, to your uh, estimate. It's either 32 or 33. I'm, I was still guessing 11. Um, do you want to just, I'd like to kind of start us off with one moment that really sticks in your mind of uh, the Playhouse kind of at its best or a, a moment that you were uh, like, felt like, wow, this is why I do this. Sure, I, I'm I'm uh, uh, pleased to do that. Um, you know, I, 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 we've done so many shows, and you've done so many shows, Chris, that I think are important and memorable and and uh, significant. And I, I do think we really pushed the envelope on what uh, resonant theaters were capable of doing. And back in the early '90s, um, we took on Tommy, the Who's Tommy. And it was um, very, very ambitious, maybe almost ludicrous. Uh, it was just liner notes from an album. There was really no talk of going, we never used the B word. We were doing it with the hopes maybe that there would be, I don't know what, a tour would go someplace, but we never talked about the B word at that time, Broadway. Um, and uh, Pete initially said that he wasn't going to get that involved in doing it and uh, that I, I had to take it on my own. And me, and then we started flying. He started flying from London to meet me in New York. And we would we both had uh, tiny children, so we would only spend about four days. But they were very intense. He's a brilliant raconteur and a, a wonderfully generous guy. I think, I guess if you're in a band like The the Who for, you know, decades, you, you learn to collaborate. So he was... Uh, an astonishingly good collaborator. And I would describe the things we were gonna do, the bed was gonna spin and Tommy was gonna come flying in. And and, uh, and I think he was kind of thinking, oh yeah, right, uh, sure. And um, I had we had a wonderful technical director and we have a wo wonderful crew, as you know, and our artisans and technicians and designers, they're the, the best anywhere. And they were really pushing me to do the things I wanted to do. For example, I wanted projections, and they were very expensive. And Don Gilmore, the technical director, wouldn't let me cut them. He said, this is your vision. So finally, Pete comes, and uh, he lived, you know, he's in England, so he's a long way away. So he came in time for the Zitz probe and very late technical rehearsals. And I remember him sitting there listening to this you know band that was virtuosic 
and just literally watching him tear up. Uh, uh, he was so moved. And of course, musicians in the theater, particularly, you know, th those that do work Broadway are, are re really the finest musicians uh, in the world. And so, they uh, they were flopped and there's Pete Townsend sitting there. And then we go over to the rehearsal. I think uh, we go over to the rehearsal. I, I think I just lost you momentarily. And um, we're, and all, and the things I had been describing because of Don Gilmore, you know, doors coming in spinning and, you know, uh, Michael Cerverus, you know, flying in from the, the uh, top of the loft. Those things were happening. The things that he thought I was just, you know, basically kidding him on. And I remembered that moment vividly because it was the moment where I thought this theater has completely arrived. Nobody else, no other group of artists, the art, the people I, you know, I, I got to work with could do this. O only these people. And uh, I still to this day believe going to uh, La Jolla Playhouse with all of the challenges we face, it was the, the best decision of my life. And my contribution creatively to the Playhouse is, is the, the most important thing to me in my career. Beautifully said and inspirational. Okay, mine is less inspirational. Um, uh, but I was thinking this morning about the first day I arrived in La Jolla um, as artistic director. It was uh, in the middle of those massive fires. Um, I guess it was 2007. Um, and right. um, the, the plane came in really like over um, the world on fire. Um, landed, I arrived at the Playhouse, and the first question was, um, I, uh, are you going to send the staff home? It's not It's not really safe. The, the air is not safe. Um, so the first thing I did was send the staff home. Uh, the second thing I did was we had a gala two days later, and we, we canceled the gala. So I, there was a certain circularness to my first day kind of rhymes with this, you know, this spring, we had to send the staff home, and uh, and we did we we shut down the playhouse uh, just a couple of days before our, we our gala. So um, there is a certain some things um, come back around, but I have to say it's at the moments of 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 most pressure of kind of this these these moments where the society is and the the world is kind of in convulsion that I think our theater matters the most, and I in both both my first day at the Playhouse and, and every day of the past couple of months, I've been so moved by the conversations with audience members and with our staff um, who I think solve problems together with such um, warmth and commitment. And I'm um, hearing what theater means to people um, in these moments of, of massive change um, just uh, makes me proud of um, what it is that we do and, um, and grateful. So um, um, I'll, I'll try to be inspirational later on. And, uh, <laughs> that was inspirational. <laughs> um, that was very inspirational. I think fire is a great metaphor to coming into the job of artistic director of any institution, maybe particularly ours. So I think fire is, a, is, a, is perfect, the perfect image. Oh, I appreciate that. So you, um, it, because you, you preceded me and actually were one of the real founding uh, like so much of the kind of refounding of the playhouse was was um, presided over um, by you. You have a, like a direct combination with the people who founded this theater in the '40s, with um, Gregory Peck and Dorothy McGuire and uh, Mel Ferrer. Um, so I'd love to like hear a little bit about what it was, what those conversations were like with those original founders when you when you arrived, and in what ways their original vision and your vision for the refounding. Um, how did those work together? You know, I, I, I got to know Gregory Peck very well, and uh, and I, I I didn't get to know Mel Ferrer and uh, uh, Dorothy McGuire as 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 well. I, I got to meet them, and they were very gracious and very uh, uh, supportive. Uh, of course, uh, I was deeply impressed by the fact that Mel Ferrer was married to Audrey Hepburn. So I, I do remember a conversation where I dared to ask him about that. Um, and, uh, so they were, you know, they were, the two of them were very supportive and then they, they were there for the reopening. Uh, Gregory Peck was endlessly wise. And, uh, I think at that time he was probably, this might be disputed by some, but the most trusted man in America, uh, perhaps based on 
uh, uh, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, and that had everything to do with the the inception of the, of the Playhouse back in '47, of course. Um, so I, 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 the stories about the way they started the theater are truly remarkable, and I'll, I think we should save those perhaps for another time. But uh, when we opened in '83, we we came along with quite a controversial production called The Visions of Simone Michard, which uh, uh, Peter Sellers, the wunderkind uh, daredevil director, put on with Ben Halley Jr. and Priscilla Smith, and it was just a remark you know truly a remarkable piece of work and all to do with with peter's vision i wanted a play that had been written roughly in 47 and so of course uh, perversely uh peter chose this brecht play the rather obscure brecht play that that he'd written when he was in california and gregory peck was uh insistent was very supportive and he was insistent at the gala, which was put on by the community and all the people that had supported us for all those years uh, in the dormant 20 years that when there was no production. And he insisted that the actors be served first, that they went to the dais, he made sure they got assembled. He made it very much about the acting, the acting community. He understood that we needed to attract people and that those the people that were with us on that first production needed to go back out into the artistic community and sing our praises he's very wise but when i asked him to get involved he said i will find a way to support you that's significant that furthers your cause i believe in what you're doing but if i get too involved people will expect you to produce the voice of the turtle your biggest challenge is going to be to create a new vision for this theater and to let the people that were with us in the, the 50s and early 60s to let it go and allow you to spread your wings with your, your fellow artists and, and, and make things grow. And, you know, he did um, a truly marvelous thing for us that first summer. He wrote a beautiful letter uh, in support of the work, and in fact, uh, even compared to, to the, the the company to uh, the, the Tyron Guthrie company, and also let us publish this letter. and And it turns out, at the time, I desperately wanted him at my side, uh, but he understood that there had to be distance. And I'm deeply appreciative of that to this day. I, I, I feel like you and I had a, a related conversation early, early uh, on in my time here where you said a very similar thing, which was you said uh, uh, that you hope um, that you could be supportive of the next phase of the Playhouse, the, 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 the new possibilities. And all the questions you asked me in our first five or six conversations were how you could help, um, you know, me sort of establish uh, the trajectory for my time here. And I, I've appreciated that all, all, always. And I'm glad to know that it's in the tradition of Gregory yeah. Peck and your conversation. And that's what you've done. And and uh, he was a very, you know, as as you know, quite young at the time. I think I was just thirty uh, when I got the appointment. And uh, the the, the uh, and you know he. He understood exactly how to be supportive, and he was a role model. I've, I've got to say, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I, I've tried to, you know, maintain. We have a very good relationship, of course, but I've tried to do that with uh, all of the, the, you know, the folks. It's funny, just very briefly, uh, Michael Langham, who had been at the place, who shut down the theater in '64 because it had basically become a sort of you know, it was mercenary by that point. The people were, I think it was one of the Gabor sisters was being paid 5000 a week and everybody else was making $25. And so he just immediately shut that down. And Michael had, Michael Lang was a, uh, also a, 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 a wonderful man like Peck. He had a, a, a concept for the theater that we have, we still use and employ. Many of the principles came from 
from uh, from Michael Langham. And I was on a plane. I at, at one point I I'd been invited to become John Hirsch's associate director at Stratford Canada, and I was with Michael. I was teaching for him at Juilliard, and we were very close. And he knew the Playhouse really well, and obviously he he was the intellectual architect behind Stratford as artistic director. So I said to him, what should I do? You know, should I go to La Jolla? It's a brand new, you know, it's a clean sheet, but it's very scary. There's, you know, no tradition and we're going to have to create or create a new tradition or go to Stratford. And, and he just said, don't ask me, I'm not giving you any advice. And then I had to thank him. And I just said, you know, he, he gave me so much time and attention. Uh, and his career was really, he was a very busy man. And I said, I just want to thank you for, for, you know, spending time with me. He definitely taught me about Shakespearean text and all kinds of things. And uh, he said, don't thank me. Just remember to do it for someone else one day. Nice. And, you know, I've, I've never forgotten that. So I, I like you because I know you do this when young directors call or ask for advice or need attention. I always remember that conversation. You know, you got to be able to pass the baton, and uh, particularly in a profession like this, where it, it's not always collegial, as we both know. And so you have to work hard uh, to do that. So Peck, Langham, you know, we stand on their shoulders. I do, and I love what you said about um, at that first um, season, uh, Gregory Peck saying, "Let just you know, take care of people." Um, it's one of the things I'm the proudest about the Playhouse staff is that they're they really take taking care of the artists and the audience as as, as the, one of the most important things we can do. And I do think that a theater is only as port important as the as the artists who make a home there. I think about the life of the Playhouse and. You know, Lauren Yee did a uh, play for us last year, Cambodian Rock Band, and is will be in our next season whenever that uh, uh, comes back online. And we have her under commission for a third. I think about these these artists who have this long, amazing arcs with La Jolla Playhouse. Uh, Robert Brill, the designer, and uh, uh, Doug Wright, uh, the author, and Will Power, and Athel Fugard, and Charlene Woodard. Um, so, and I, I think that you very much made that theater of of kind of long-term commitments to artists. And I, um, I think it's important. You know, I think you've, you've, uh, I, I think uh, eclipsed the work we did in that way. I think you've built so many important relationships with artists and, and it's true. I, it's when people, and perhaps we'll, uh, have the misfortune of discussing the future because it's such, it's always such a hard thing to do with the arts. And I think the best you can do, is to create a meaningful home for an artist. You can't predict the art of tomorrow. I mean, perhaps that can happen in marketing surveys, but they only really can deal with the work that someone liked before. You know, we, we depend on artists to take us into the future. And I think the most important thing to do is to create uh, support mechanisms and forums uh, so that artists can fulfill their dreams. I mean. That's the reason I came to the Playhouse. The, the search committee said to me, I, I asked them why they were interested in me after we spent some time together. And they said, well, we want to fulfill your dreams. You know, I told them about my dream theater, which is what they asked me to do. And that, I think that's why, why uh, you came along. And, 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 you know, you came along because uh, you had uh, a passion for the work and you had a sense of where the theater needed to go uh, in terms of building those uh, uh, forums and and you've done that I think with 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 a Wow with the Wow Festival with DNA you know you've you've created uh, new canvases uh, uh, for artists to work on but you haven't told them the murals they need to paint you've let left that to them but you you've you've expanded uh, on uh, the work that was done before you arrived so. And, and being led by the artists turns out to be so crucial at a moment like this. You know, it's because we've, we've had to sort of shut down live performance for the now. We really went back to a lot of the artists who made wow pieces for festivals in the past and said, if you were going to create something online, what would that be? And the, the difference, the wild eclectic difference of what kinds of art people want to make and what kinds of forms they want to use, even when limited to the work on a computer screen or, or a, 
um, a cell phone is is very inspirational. And um, and it's it's been interesting to my fear when I kind of unleashed the possible, you know, said left, put an open invitation out to say artists make something for now is that there would be um, um, a lot of um, gl gloom or upset uh, exploration of that. And I've been very uh, amazed by actually how um, how solution oriented and and hopeful the work has been um, and how committed to the importance of human beings connecting and reconnecting. Uh, it's it, it really feels like artists are looking for the light at the end of the tunnel and not looking at the, you know, the sort of the gloom of the moment, which I'm very inspired by. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, throw back a real compliment at you. The one of the the programs that has been the most um, satisfying to work on every year is something that you founded, which is the Pop Tour. Um, these are um, new new plays that are commissioned every year um, that go to area schools and and libraries all over San Diego um, County, and um, this like amazing. Um, uh, the experience of watching these young audiences for the right. many of them for the first seeing a play for the first time is so extraordinary. Um, I, can you talk a little bit about what what how did that program come to be? You know, uh, first of all, uh, when I, I started my career in Toronto, and there was a wonderful woman there in Toronto named Susan Rubish, and she had a company called Young People's Theater and sent out a show, uh, uh, a show, a number of shows. But the, but the way it would work is you would go out, you know, in a van with four or five, six actors, usually recorded sound system, there were often songs. Anyway, and they would tour all through um, uh, Ontario. And when you were a, a playwright, you got, a, you know, this was very important, you got a commission. And I think you got, I think you got $50 a performance um, and that was fantastic, you know, so it was a way of getting work to young audiences. And it was also a way of supporting the artists in the Toronto theater scene, which was burgeoning, but everyone needed support. And I think you got $25 for lyrics and $25 for a score. But if they did two shows a day, you know, if you wrote book music and lyrics, that was, that was, that was uh, enough to pay the rent. So and she was fantastic, and she she gave a lot of freedom to people. Um, and so when I came to the Playhouse, one of the things that was clear is that we we felt a little bit isolated up on the hill. And I love our facility, and I love people flocking to it. But it seemed to make sense to try, like Susan did in Toronto, to get out into the community to take the playhouse to the schools and to provide work for them and also to to commission our leading artists to do that work and so we had this dream and quite frankly we came up with pop before we knew what it meant and it was our brilliant dramaturg who had uh, of course gabe's job robert blacker who had everything to do with the the uh, structure of the theater and uh, as you know chris was such an important force at the playoffs. We lost him sadly in September. Uh, he was a, uh, a very erudite and passionate, and he came up with performance outreach program after we already had pop. Uh, and I was at the way it started was I, I was I was as as we do, you know, we sing for our supper, and we I was speaking to a group of uh, donors and subscribers out on the deck one night and I was talking about the importance of this program that we wanted to launch. And Peter and Peggy Price came over to me afterwards uh, to patrons uh, in, in our community, to important patrons. And they said, we like the sound of that. How much do you need to launch it? And I said, well, I think we need $25,000. And they said, consider it done. And so, you know, that became part of our activity every year. It kept us busy in the winter when we weren't able to produce there. And I now I know it's reached hundreds of thousands of, of, of kids and I dare say changed some lives. What I like about what you did with that, uh, aside from just keeping that going and, and, uh, and building it and developing it, 
is that it, you also found other ways to get off campus. You know, that we, like the university, there is a town and gown side to uh, what we do. And you've managed to do that, uh, particularly with the, the, the um, you know, the WOW Festival. Uh, you, you understand the importance of getting out to the community. And that's the best way, I think, frankly, to get the community to, uh, to come to you. And that certainly has happened with, with the, the pop tour. I've, I've had adults come to me and say that their introduction to the Playhouse was in the you know, 1980s when we, they saw a play in their, in their cafetorium in Poway. I love that. Hey, we have a special guest. Speaking of the pop tour, uh, an artist who's at the at the red hot center of the of the pop tour now. Um, her name is Jacole Kitchen, and she is the artistic programs manager at Lower Playhouse, and also our local casting director. She's produced pop tours. Um, she directed uh, one of the uh, ones in the past, and is also the director of our upcoming twenty twenty one pop tour, Pick Me Last. Um, uh, and uh, she also oversees um, quite a lot of our um, La Jolla Playhouse kind of community programming. Um, so she's um, she's 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 central, and um, she's here with us today. So uh, welcome, Jacole. Glad to have you. Thanks, Chris. Hi, Des. Yeah, I like Hi. to think of myself as a Playhouse essential worker. So so thank you for <laughs> <laughs> you for absolutely that, are. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit? So I, you know, the the, the Playhouse is just it, the the reach of it is a kind of extraordinary. I think that it's reached hundreds of thousands of students over the years. Um, and um, uh, can you talk about the the upcoming pop tour? Yeah, uh, I would love to know what that uh, collective number is because. Currently, the pop tour is impacting um, about 20,000 students per year. So with the number of years it's been running, I would love for somebody to do that math. Um, but so excited about this upcoming pop tour. Like you said, Chris, this is my third as producer. It will be second as director. And I could not be more excited um, about this upcoming one. One, we are working with a legend. Talk about a gladiator in American theater, but I would say definitely a gladiator in uh, youth theater, Idris Goodwin. Um, he is a creative force that works across multiple formats. He's a spoken word artist. He's a hip hop artist. He's an educator. He's a playwright. Um, and he specializes in theater for young audiences. And all of those aspects of his work in his art artistry are going to be incorporated into um, this upcoming production, Pick Me Last. Uh, in this play, he is doubling down on the idea that has been incorporated into a number of the pop tours over the last couple of years, which is um, one person's ability to make change, the power of the individual to make real change. Um, in this upcoming pop tour, it is centered around two 10-year-olds, uh, Siobhan and her best friend, Wes, who is always getting picked last on the playground for every game. Any game that involves a ball, Wes will be picked last for. And uh, Siobhan is tired of seeing it happen. And after studying the butterfly effect, she realizes that she maybe can put a plan in place that would get her picked last, therefore making sure that Wes does not. But as she goes through this, she realizes maybe the problem that she's trying to solve isn't the one that needs fixing. I love that. Hey, just right. in our little ch private chat uh, text, um, I'm being told by uh, Playhouse staff that uh, uh, roughly half a million um, kids have seen the pop tour over the years. So that's a, um, a satisfying uh, number. Can you talk a little bit about, just in response to this very moment, um, the commissions of the uh, pop playwrights and, and how that's working? Yeah, um, well, couple with the pop tour in general, uh, it's always a brand new commission with a playwright. It's a little more than $50 now. I understand that that's where the program started um, with the cost of living going up. So has our uh, Playhouse commissions. Um, but it's always a brand new play of dealing with something that is relevant for uh, students, something that is uh, an issue that is they are dealing with in this current moment. So it's always very current, always very relevant. Um, but in response to our current moment and what we're um, what we're facing with as far as this uh, the COVID isolation and stay at home orders is 
we have commissioned um, a number of TYA playwrights to write 10 minute plays that families and educators can use to have their students create, that parents and families can uh, recreate at home and film uh, and then send back to us to see, but then also that educators can use uh, virtually as well as part of their curriculum. Fantastic. One of those playwrights um, is Reese Goodwin, so we can't get enough of him right now. <laughs> you're also um, kind of overseeing the Veterans Playwriting Workshop. Uh, could you tell a little bit about how that program works? Yeah, thank you so much. Veterans Playwriting Workshop, again, we talk about uh, successful programs, engagement programs uh, at the Playhouse. And this one, I feel like, is one that has been successful because it's been completely driven by the participants themselves. Mm -hmm. Every different phase, every different uh, version of the playwriting workshop has been 100% in response to feedback that we've gotten from the participants. Uh, we have gone, taken one cohort through three phases of the playwriting workshop, which culminated in all of them writing a full length play of their own. One of those we've talked about quite a bit. Um, uh, one of our playwrights, Cherie Engel, submitted the play that she wrote during the workshop to uh, the Arts and the Armed Forces Playwriting Award and actually won last year. And oh. has uh, she got a reading at the public through that award. We did a reading at the Playhouse. And um, Lucy Tobergen, who is a Playhouse director who we've worked with quite a bit, but also directed the reading at the public, is a huge champion of this piece now and uh, is, is really hoping to get a production for, for Cherie. And that's something that was homegrown through our program. Um, and again, switching to uh, shifting to the world that we're currently living in, we just launched our very first uh, virtual veterans playwriting workshop that's happening on Saturdays throughout the summer. And we have our two facilitators, it, it couldn't be a better pair, Maurice DeCall is actually uh, a Marine Corps veteran and playwright who got this program started with us. He brought this to us three years ago as a pilot and so to be able to bring it full circle and have him as one of our facilitators and Justin Hudnall uh, from So Say We All who is a local writing group and has been integral in uh, us getting our uh, veterans programs off the ground. I love that. It's interesting thinking about the 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 now and the and and the future um, of the playhouse and our, and our world, it like it feel like the secret to everything right now is agility and innovation, right? Like you just can't do things the way you, you always have. It's like the circumstances are changing too fast, and I do think that that's been one of the real strengths of the playhouse through the years is a kind of commitment to challenging assumptions about what kinds of stories are we going to tell, how are we going to tell them. You know, it, it feels like there's something that's deeply right about being on the campus of UCSD, which is a research and innovation kind of hub. Um, uh, I, I think a lot about Des, your your production of Yoshimi, which just, you know, technically had all of these incredibly adventurous, um, really leading edge um, technologies and ideas uh, harnessed to this incredible imaginative vision. So, um, um, that that production, I, I I I whenever I see somebody uh, innovating, I, I I part of me thinks about Yoshimi. Thank you. Well, it was it was a a, a joy to do, and uh, you were uh, wonderful producers, as I would expect. Uh, but uh, really, again, I don't think that could have happened anywhere but uh, at uh, the La Jolla Playhouse. One little thing, just uh, Jacol talking about the importance of, of uh, the pop tour and artists and commissions and so on. Um, I was just thinking as, as you were speaking, you know, in the very first uh, pop tour, which I think was in uh, 86, um, one of the actresses in that, uh, uh, she was just starting to, just starting out. She, I don't think she was equity at that point or she just was, got her equity card and uh, she was, uh, 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 you know, in San Diego and trying to work. And, and she's now a, a, a substantial Broadway star and that's Alice Ripley. And so she, her, and so I, I don't think that's the reason we do it, but I think one of the very happy uh, benefits of, of, of the pop tour is that it, it does become a launching pad uh, for the, you know, for, for, for emerging artists. Uh, and and 
I, I think that's another contribution that it's made over the years. Reminds me of, uh, I think, Kayala Settle, who's turned into kind of a, a big deal through Greatest Showman and other uh, projects, uh, started out as a sound operator on the pop tour uh, uh, decades ago. So you never know who's on stage or backstage at our pop tours. Um, how are you feeling? Do we want to uh, open up to some questions uh, from, um, from watchers? Uh, Chris, I, I wanted to point out uh, that we did have a comment that came in through the chat from a teacher, uh, Amy Kenneth, Ken Smith, I believe, that the pop tour came through their school last year and the kids absolutely loved it. So they, she just wanted to say thank you for providing such an amazing experience to the students through the pop Great. tour. Very much appreciated. Thank you for that. Um, good. So um, if there's other, um, uh, Gabe, you're back. Hello. And I think we're gonna welcome Debbie back as well. And we are gonna open it up. So please do uh, feel free to leave comments or questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, we would love to answer them. A few of you got a jump on this and started emailing questions last night. So we have a few oh. already. People are very eager about this. And Des, the first one was from you, for you from a subscriber, Rob, who asks, when is that esteemed band, the Cadillac Cowboys returning to the Playhouse? Oh my heavens. Well, um, <laughs> You know, you've been with us a long time, sir. So uh, thank you so much. You know, I, I, I've gotten to play uh, with some of the, uh, the guys who actually went on to do Jersey Boys, um, Joe Payne, and, and there, there are some wonderful, the Dow Brothers and so on. The band you're talking about uh, uh, was, I think it was, the, again, I think that was 86. And they came together for a, a, a group called Gillette. And Tommy Rivers and the guitar player, he played lead guitar in that. His name was uh, Billy Coover. We called him Rockabilly Coover. They are still playing. And I, I still, from time to time, run into them. And again, they were absolutely top drawer. And, and it was, I got to play with them. It was such a joy um, you know, to do that. And I know it's basically an abuse of power to insert yourself into the band. I, I'm like... I, have, I hope I, you know, wasn't like James Dolan of, you know, the the Knicks who who uh, who, who does that. But but it was that was a lot of fun, and and that was written by uh, Bill Houtman, the play that did that, who was a, a Will, William Houtman, who's a a wonderful uh, Southern, you know, writer, uh, and uh, that was a great joy. But I, I haven't, I, I must say, uh, heard them for quite a while. But that's a uh, Perhaps you've given me an idea. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we another person wrote in uh, about directing the pop tour. Jacole, um, as a as a multi term veteran of pop tour directing, how do you, as someone who who directs both for young audiences and uh, adult shows, how do you approach a show that's geared for young audiences as opposed to uh, an adult show? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, really, the approach isn't much different at all. To me, it's still about authenticity and really tapping into uh, the reality of the world that you're creating and the reality for those characters. Um, I think that it's essential that the kids not feel talked at, but talked to. And so I'm making sure that the actors are really uh, thinking from the 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 standpoint of a young person and not necessarily putting your grown people's uh, assumptions on what this child who is the character is saying and doing. So authenticity is is still 100% key to me. I would say the sight lines are a little bit different. Um, and so there's a lot more floor acting that happens. Um, and I, I, I was very lucky to have a very uh, petite assistant director the last time that I worked. And I was able to have her go and sit Indian stuff, or crisscross applesauce, excuse me. I was able to have her go sit crisscross applesauce on the floor in different places to make sure that she could see from uh, everything I needed her to see from, from that lower angle. But other than that, I think that the approach is, is pretty similar. I want to uh, track uh, a couple of things that have just popped up in the chat. First of all, thank you. Lisa Smith has just posted a comment. I love the Playhouse and have since 1983. It has expanded my oh. thinking and feeling so much. Thank you, Lisa, for that. And a question from Jan, who references the uh, Digital Wow show that we just did last weekend. She loved the 12-hour without wall show, uh, Show Me a Good Time, the Gob Squad show. 
do you know how many people tuned in uh, for over the course of those 12 hours? Uh, do you have that statistic in front of you, Gabe? We do. We actually, uh, the home Thank office you. has just beamed it home in. Home office. I love uh, that. We had 1,500 uh, unique viewers for the 12-hour stream, uh, including, I believe, it was all over the world, um, New Zealand and, uh, and Germany, of course, and just really uh, China, amazing countries. Um, and... Oh yes, and that's right. We got an email. <laughs> we got an email from some a viewer in South Korea who said she watched the entire twelve-hour event. So that I that is that. pretty remarkable. The, the statistic from the Wow one one statistic that I I, I love from the Wow programming is the um, Culture Clash has been doing the totally fake Latino news. Uh, they did. We released the first episode, and the second one's about to drop. And um, their first episode was watched by um, 121,000 people in Mexico, as well as people around the world. And that, uh, as a as a theater that's always been kind of uh, trying to activate work across the border, since we're so so close to that border, uh, it's really satisfying to think of 121,000 uh, Mexican cities and enjoy citizens enjoying that work. All right, so Des, I have a question for you. What do you miss about San Diego? What do I miss about San Diego? I, I, Brenna and I uh, actually talk about this uh, uh, quite a bit. And, and uh, there are times when we think we made a, a terrible mistake in, in terms of not uh, uh, you know, buying a home there instead of here. We're actually in Western Connecticut. And I, I, it did cross my mind at, the point, though, at, at that point, though, that, that, that uh, Chris and Debbie may have found me to be a tremendous pest if I was there on, you know, somewhere on the side of Mount Soledad. So, uh, but I, I miss, I, I, I definitely miss um, uh, really all aspects of the theater. Um, you know, I, 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 I love the community. Uh, I felt like we made a real contribution to San Diego in terms of the, you know, the, the, the life there and, and the arts, life in the arts. And that was a great feeling. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, people got to know me well and, and, and I think often treated me like I was a relative. And that, that's a really nice uh, thing for an artist to have, that sort of sense of community. So there are, there, there are many things I miss about it. Some, people will, will often say, oh, I bet you don't miss the fundraising. I bet you don't miss the fundraising. And, you know, that's not true. Uh, I, the, the fact of, with fundraising, it's not that there's too much of it. It's that there are too few opportunities to fundraise. And if I could, you know, if I could have had a, 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 an hour in the day every day where I was talking to somebody about a gift or bringing, uh, I would have spent that hour or two hours or whatever it took. There, there is no greater privilege than asking for support for something you believe in. That, that is the greatest privilege in terms of running an institution. One thing I just have to tell you in terms of baby making mistakes, I was doing a, a, a Shakespeare lecture of all things hoity-toity um, and, you know, with, with the uh, Zoom a, a kind of podcast and, and, uh, and I'm, 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 you know, wrapping my answer, you know, doing, doing my thing. And, and um, I, I actually had to uh, interrupt it because I, I looked out this window which you can't see, and there was literally a black bear scrambling across the lawn and stealing one of our bird feeders. And I had to go out. We have a, a border collie, and I had to go out and um, you know drive the bear off, which was probably not the wisest thing I've ever done. And uh, I remember at that time coming back and thinking, should have stayed in San Diego, should have been <laughs> looking at the pelicans. I thought you were um, going to make an exit pursued by a bear comment. I, uh, you, you, you were thinking it. It was, it <laughs> was, was a, it. it was the, it was definitely the, the winter's tale uh, definitely came up a lot in the conversation, you know, uh, after that. So thank you for that, Debbie, for being uh, knowledgeable and knowing your Shakespeare. You know, just Jacole, you said something lovely about authenticity, and you know, in that class, one of the things that always comes up is, you know when you're taking on formality, uh, Chris goes through this all the time, if you're doing a musical and so on, 
And you know, I love what you said. I, I think this is what we what we always say to actors that it's really essentially about truth. And genres differ, and in often with a, a musical and and even with 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 you know a, with a, a verse drama, you know the the vessel may be larger. And that's true with musicals too. If you're doing a funny thing happen on the way to the forum and you're playing pseudolus, you're, it's a larger than life character. But what you said was terrific because I think that's, that's what it's about. It's about filling that character up with truth. And if there's one thing that applies to everything we do, it's that. And so I loved your comment. Thank you. And I just want to say, Des, I loved your comment about um, just in support of the fundraising and, and the importance that you give to that. And I want to give a special thank you to all the subscribers, so many of whom have uh, given above and beyond their subscription price each year to support the pop tour, to support the Veterans Playwriting Workshop. Um, you have all of our gratitude uh, and, and, and make what we do possible. Uh, Debbie, I want to uh, also, uh, sorry, I, I know that we're probably running close on time, but there was a question that came in that asked, what drew you to the Playhouse? Ah. Well, I, I spent the 1980s in Washington and 90s in Washington, DC um, at the Kennedy Center. And um, well, I spent the early 1980s as an undergraduate at UC San Diego, right when Des and the Playhouse were kind of emerging. And so I was here when that was happening, but I wasn't a theater student, I was a poli-sci student. Um, and then I was at the Kennedy Center in the 1990s as the general counsel there. And we actually did a piece called Faust with the Randy Newman piece that was, it started here at the Playhouse and moved to the Kennedy Center. So I was sort of always aware of the Playhouse because of being at UCSD as an undergraduate and, and then doing the work at the, at, at the Kennedy Center. But um, when I was moving to Southern California, my family had grown and I wanted to come back home and I wanted to work in theater. Um, and there really was no other place that I wanted to go. And so as I was leaving the Kennedy Center, people said, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, I'm gonna knock on the door at the La Jolla Playhouse and see if they need a lawyer or a general manager or something. And weirdly, it was right when Des and the former managing director were getting ready to build the new La Jolla Playhouse you know, facilities, the Potiker Theater and our offices. And they did need um, a, a lawyer general manager. And so I, I, I was lucky enough to knock on the door at the right time and Des hired me. And I have, uh -huh. I have been here ever since and it's gonna be very hard to get rid of me. So <laughs> lucky to be here. And we're very <laughs> proud that, that you're now a managing director. And it, 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 it frankly feels like destiny to me because you have that um, you know, passion for the work and you also have that it's a terribly cold phrase, but you, you do have institutional memory. I mean, you really are, uh, you know, you, it's so articulate about uh, what the theater is about and where it comes from. And I think that's invaluable. And I know yeah, but you are also a way. great partner. You are just you. a real, uh, just like showing up every day to, to run the theater with you is a, is, is, is a great privilege and really fun. Thank you. Oh, and it's, I, I actually love what you said about fundraising, Des. I mean, a, a huge part of my job is about fundraising, and it is a, it's an honor and a privilege um, to raise money for the work that everybody else on this screen except me gets to do for the pop tour, for new play development, for commissions, to develop new musicals. I mean, it's just, it's, there isn't another theater, I, I guess it's self-serving to say, but there just isn't another theater in the United States that does the kind of work that the Playhouse does. And it's an honor to work here, and it's an it, you know an honor to meet all the people who come in every night w that we're doing theater to watch what what you guys do. So it's amazing. you know it's interesting. People often ask, and Chris, I'm sure you experienced this, and uh, Debbie, you know what what are the differences between the jobs? And so I was asked that question so so many times that I finally had to come up with a succinct answer. Uh, uh, because generally it would be asked in, in a group of people and, and most of them would, were probably not interested in the answer at all. So I, I needed to be brief. And so I, I, I think it's, it's simply that, you know, with, with uh, our, the artistic director, the responsibilities are production and then fundraising and then administration. And the, for the managing director, it's just the inverted. It's administration, it's fundraising, and it's production. And it's so the that obviously a strong partership like the one, the, uh, one that you have is is just the lifeblood of the 
of the theater. So I, I hope you both stay for a long, long time. Thank you. Thank you for that. I would also say that we are all the people who have who have um, worked at the Playhouse are are. I, I, I'm lucky to make work for this audience. I was looking at Lisa Smith's comment that she's loved the Playhouse since 83. I mean, there's so much of that audience has been with the Playhouse um, for decades, are so knowledgeable about how new plays and new musicals get made, you know, the, in, in a talk back there, um, you know, so articulate about here's what we here's what we see, here's what we think might help. They know how to talk to artists. The conversations in the lobbies and in the aisles are um, so many great ideas come out of it. Um, and unlike um, being a freelance artist, where you're talking just to an audience for two hours, the great privilege of of being an artistic director is you get to talk to an audience for seasons and decades, and you get this kind of rich palette of of, of maybe a hundred plays to explore the world together. And uh, I, I would say that the, the audience at the Playhouse is a real pleasure to explore the world with. Here, here. Very much so. Uh, I just want to share one very quick memory. I, I was mentioning to a friend that uh, I would be on this event with uh, Chris and Des today. And they said, well, what what is it like serving as a dra you've dramaturg for both of them? Um, what is it like? And I, I will just say, you both place a very high um, level of, of opportunity and respect on that position uh, in a way that's extremely gratifying and wonderful. You're both endlessly curious and eager to hear um, how dramaturgical research can in, inform and deepen the world of the play. Um, but I, so I've worked with Chris uh, over probably close to 10 shows. Uh, I only had the chance to work with Des on Yoshimi, and I will never forget that Shirley Fishman, who uh, served in my role for so many years, came out with Des uh, when he started his second tenure, um, took me aside and said, okay, you're dramaturging for Des, so here's what you have to know. You, he's gonna turn over uh, a, a day or two of rehearsals to you, so you have to have enough research to, um, to fill those days. And I talked to Adam Greenfield, who's now the artistic director of Playwrights Horizons, but who held my position. And he said, be ready, have a lot of dramaturgical research. You're gonna be running a day or two. So I compiled all of this research in Yoshimi. It was about the flaming lips. It was about this highly experimental um, cancer treatment at the time that was very cutting edge. And I just came with reams and reams of dramaturgy. And I was just prepared to like take over those days. And midway through the second day, I, I, I thought to myself, oh my God, have I gone too far? And I looked over at Des and he was a little glazed. And, <laughs> okay, perhaps I've gone a little too far, but I, I am grateful to you both as artists for um, the pride of place you put on, uh, on that deepening of the world. So thank you. Well, it's, it's selfish because it's, a, it's an excuse to go to graduate school a couple of times. You know, that's, that's always my theory that if you get somebody who's a, done a lot of research and it is kind of become an expert in a field, then for the actors, if they spend those 20 hours or 15, 30 hours, I, we've spent days in, in some cases, then it's really the equivalent of, of them taking a, a, a master's course. And, um, I, and, and, and but the nice thing for us is uh, we, uh, we get to sit there. If my eyes were glazing over, I'm sure it had more to do with fear of starting rehearsal than it did <laughs> of giving up from your nose. So. Well, thank you. Uh, and just uh, as before we close it out, just uh, wanting to say thank you to Stephen Nagler for saying we are all lucky to have your immense skills and passion in our neighborhood. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thanks to all of you. Um, anybody, uh, a final word before we log off for this installment? Thank you for joining us. Um, it, it, it's such a, an important theater. I, 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 uh, I hope to come back many, many times. And uh, your support for this organization is deeply appreciated. And I'm speaking to everyone that's, uh, that's on right now. Deeply appreciated. Des, would you stay on afterwards? We'll talk about your next project. Just, Great. Just I'm, stay I'm on there. afterwards. Everything I'll leave. OK, good. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it in the capable hands of Debbie. Uh, to say goodbye for all of us. Thank you. Well, I just want to tell everyone that we miss you again to stay well, be safe so that we can welcome you back. And um, we just can't wait to do that. So whether it's, this, whether it's the late fall, the early winter, or the spring, whenever we can, we can't wait to see you. We've got a whole lot of art that's being 
made ready to, to welcome you back with and to just thank Chris and Des and Nicole and Gabe um, for everything that you guys all continue to do to make the Playhouse such an amazing home for artists and for people who appreciate art. So thank you to all of you. Have a wonderful weekend.